What's up, y'all? Welcome to the next episode of the Passive Income Attorney Podcast. I hope you're having a fantastic week. Thanks for joining in on the fun. If you're ready to start creating your own economy and start taking back control of your life, go to attorneybydesign.com, whether you're an attorney or not, and download the Freedom Blueprint to get started today. All right. Who loves Chick-fil-A? Everybody, right? Yeah, I'll leave it at that. But who owns these things? And I'm not talking about the business, although we will dive into franchising very soon as an alternative investment. But what I'm talking about today is the, the building itself. Who owns that Wendy's or that Walgreens on your block? Well, I'll tell you who could, and it's you. These types of assets are called triple net retail. Triple net basically means you own the building and your tenant pays for everything else. Taxes, insurance, maintenance, it's all passed on to the tenant. So once it's leased, you sit back and collect checks. Sounds easy enough, right? Well, maybe not quite that easy, but our triple net retail and all things commercial, AKA CRE, expert guest Dan Lukowitz is here today to answer all your burning questions about owning these incredible assets. Dan is a good friend of mine and a seasoned real estate veteran starting his career house hacking, then into flipping. And now he's the director of sales at Encore Real Estate Investment Services, specializing in shopping centers, medical office buildings, and industrial fulfillment centers. Dan resides in Oak Park, Michigan, and enjoys running, lifting weights, yoga, and playing acoustic guitar. Let's jump in. This is the Passive Income Attorney Podcast where you'll discover the secrets and strategies of the ultra wealthy on how they build streams of passive income to give them the freedom we all want. Attorney Seth Bradley will help you end the cycle of trading your time for money so you can make money while you sleep. Start living the good life on your own terms. Now, here's your host, Seth Bradley. Dan Lugowitz, what's going on, brother? Welcome to the show. Hey, Seth, thanks for having me. How you doing? Uh, doing great, man, doing great. How about you? Yeah, no complaints. Really good. Good, good. All right, brother. Well, let's just jump right in, man. Tell me, tell me about yourself. Tell me your story. Take it back as far as you want to go, man. Sure. So I'm Dan Lukowitz. I am a net lease investment sales broker, which means that I sell buildings that are typically leased out to major national tenants. So you can think your Walgreens, your Rite Aids, your Starbucks, your quick service restaurant like Taco Bell, Wendy's, McDonald's. We do a lot of pharmacy deals. We do a lot of an industrial product a lot of multi-tenant uh, medical office buildings um, and automotive repair parts amongst amongst other categories. So essentially that's what I do. I'm also the co-creator of the CRE Pro course, which is a course that's designed to teach uh, people everything they need to know about commercial real estate investing and specifically how to become a top commercial real estate broker. Uh, I would say that I, I got my start in the industry back in 2005 when I formed a company with some friends of mine called Disability Made Easy. That was a barrier-free home modification company. And I was in charge of the sales and marketing. That's kind of my, my, my personality, you know, that sales, uh, sales flair. And um, essentially what really, really got it for me was I, I was out on a, on a job with our project manager. And I remember pulling up to this house and seeing something that was, you know, functionally obsolete and wasn't of service at all to the owner. And just seeing him take out his, his graph paper and his pen and in 45 seconds, drawing out a sketch and turning something that was functionally obsolete into something that served a purpose and was, was beneficial to the occupant really kind of emblazoned in my mind, this idea of being able to take something um, and, and, and recreate it and reposition it and make it you know, suitable to, uh, to the owner. And that really, I think, got me going. And that was what springboarded me initially into um, you know, the purchase, renovation, and resale of single family properties in and around the city of Detroit. Um, which is something that I did for a number of years um, while I was, uh, you know, business development executive at Amazon. And eventually, I, when I left, you know, corporate America, kind of similar to you, and I, I went into real estate investing full time and later into commercial brokerage full time. That was also a big, you know, springboard and aha moment. And um, you know, I've since transitioned exclusively into net lease investment sales brokerage, as I mentioned before, and that's that's really where I spend my time. Gotcha. So kind of your inflection point wasn't necessarily something like you, you didn't like your career, you weren't happy at, at Amazon or something like that. It was like you, you saw somebody doing real estate, like flipping a house and you're like, wow, that, that's pretty incredible how they do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was, I think that was the first one was to see this idea of being able to take something 
and and recreate it and repurpose it. Um, that was definitely one. I would say I did have an inflection point, you know, in corporate America when you know it was, when I decided to leave Amazon. I said to myself, "How many properties do I need to own to replace my income?" And and at the time, the answer was twenty, and that's just what I did. I went out and bought them and 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 started getting them going. So that for me. That, that moment of freedom, right, of being completely in control of my own financial destiny for better or for worse was also a big, you know, turning point and aha moment in my career. I love that. You, you kind of just put it on paper, uh, put an end goal in mind. There's 20 houses to be, you know, financially free so you can walk away and you accomplish that goal. And then what, what kind of made you get into the sales just because you had a flair for it? I mean, anybody that meets you knows that you're, you're great at sales, man. But, you know, what, what told you that you were ready to make that jump? You know, in terms of like sales in general, is that is that that being a part of my career? Is that what you mean? Well, I guess in the real estate more specifically. Ah, uh, yeah. So I mean, I think that I always had a you know I love people, I love interacting with people, and I love the idea of of isolating a problem and then solving the problem. So I think that's why I'm I'm attracted to sales and 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 successful in sales. And in terms of real estate, I think that you know just the, the real I guess you know when I saw that moment where he was able to take something and totally recreate it, that was a big big point for me. And then you know what happened was it was time for myself and my family to buy our first home, and we had a property that was like ready to go turnkey, and um, had a purchase agreement out on it and ready to go. And then I noticed that just a block over, there was a bank owned property. So I got in touch with the lender and they were willing to sell it, bought the property. And I, I literally contracted out every single trade. I told all the guys, I said, listen, I'm going to pay you a little bit more, but I'm going to hang on to the job site and I'm going to annoy you. And I'm going to ask you tons of questions. And that's how I really kind of got my feet wet into real estate investing was to see it firsthand and to feel it and to, to live with it, you know, for months. And that's, that really was just that put me on, on, you know, hyperdrive saying, wow, this is awesome. I've got something that's worth, you know, let's just say $200,000, you know, in, in move-in condition, something I can buy for 50, put in 20, and it's the same thing at the end. Yeah, that's important. I think that a lot of folks probably similar to yourselves that, that sell, uh, you know, big commercial real estate, very sophisticated properties probably don't have that kind of boots on the ground type of experience with, you know, managing subcontractors on single family houses and stuff. But it's awesome knowledge to have to see what all goes into it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, you know, I, I, I look at single family, you know, house flipping as I call it a gateway drug, um, you know, <laughs> kind of gets people into commercial real estate. And, you know, at, at the same time, people would ask me what I did for a living, and I would half joke with them and tell them, you know, I'm in adult daycare because essentially that's that's what it was. And I guess from my perspective, having that background of being able to see what it's like to have boots on the ground and be completely active to, to not having boots on the ground, right? I don't I don't go see my properties. I don't really know my, I don't meet my clients. I, I get to know them. We become friendly. I don't go to closings. I'm, I'm probably as, pass, as passive as you can get. So I do have that, you know, balanced background of both. Yeah. Yeah, well, let's jump into the triple net stuff, man, because a lot of folks don't even know what that means. So maybe start with the basics. Like what, what does triple net even mean? Yeah, so everything's in a name, right? So uh, an, a, an absolute net or a net lease property in general, the reason that we call them that is that the, the rental amount that the tenant pays is actually net to the landlord. So let's contrast that with something like multifamily, which you know very well, and I'm sure a lot of your, your viewers and listeners know well. So let's just say we've got, you know, a Wendy's property I just put on the market. It's got $125,000 of, of, uh, of rental income every year. So that is net to the investor. Whereas let's say you have a small multifamily that has $125,000 of gross collected rents, right? That's the income from the property. However, there's going to be expenses, right? You're going to have things like management, you might have vacancy, you're going to have capital expenditures and maintenance. You're going to have things like plowing the parking lot and cutting the grass. Um, you're going to have to pay taxes. You're going to have to pay insurance. So all of those things are going to be, you know, on your profit and loss report are going to show up on your expenses and your net operating income is your gross collected rents minus your expenses. Whereas in triple net leases, the tenant pays for your taxes, the tenant pays for your insurance, the tenant pays for all maintenance and repairs and management if there is any. So that $125,000 in the triple net deal, that is net to you. You're, you if you look at your balance, at, at your, your P&L, it shows $125,000 collected, zero expenses, $125,000 of net operating income. So that's where we get that name of a net lease. Now, there's different types of net leases. The, the, the gold standard is really what I mentioned before, that absolute triple net lease where the landlord has zero responsibilities whatsoever. There are other types of net leases too, like a double net lease, 
where the landlord is responsible for things like the roof and the structure, and in some cases, the parking lot. But in general, we're dealing with these, these traditional absolute triple net leases, very stable, very secure. Another great thing about them is that uh, they're, they're, they're highly predictable, right? Your lease is often for 15 or 20 years or more, and all of the terms are spelled out very clearly. In fact, everything all the way down to the rental escalations, showing you how much you're going to make every single year are built into that lease. Um, another, another factor that's very important is that, uh, you know, in regards to the stability and security is that most of these leases are uh, rented out to tenants that have hundreds, if not thousands of locations, right? So whereas in multifamily, if a tenant doesn't pay their rent, you've got to evict them and now you have to fill that vacancy in, in net lease property. If the tenant goes out of business or they decide to close that location, they're still on the hook because they're guaranteeing that lease based on the entire corporation. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, it sounds like it could be pretty passive uh, from the owner's perspective. Is that, is that correct? It's probably the most passive form of real estate investing. In fact, we often look at it as a bond that's tied up in sticks and bricks. <laughs> I like that. I like that. So um, if you do negotiate this and you've got a triple net, a true triple net lease, I mean, do you have to have any management on the property or is it totally on the tenant? I mean, you literally just own it and, and let it happen, get it leased up and then let it happen. You own it and, and you let it happen. And in fact, these, these assets are, are more often than not sold, leased up and cash flowing. So you're, you're literally buying a bond, right? You're buying a bond at 5%, 5.5%, 6%, 6.5%, whatever it is with those rental escalations to hedge against inflation. And you, you put it on autopilot. I mean, you're going to sit there and collect your rental check or your ACH every month. And Oftentimes these properties are in different states and the investors really never go and visit because there's absolutely no reason to. Yeah. So with, with that in mind, do you have a lot of, you know, doctors and attorneys and people that, you know, have another profession or a high paying W2 that own these types of properties? Certainly. Yes, absolutely. In fact, I have a very, I have a good client right now who I just listed two hospitals for him uh, yesterday. We just sold a big medical office building for him about two months ago. Oh, he's an, a doctor, he's a physician, and he, he got so you know, interested in, in, in this space that he ended up becoming a developer. And now he buys property, he builds to suit for a specific medical tenant, signs a lease, cash flows it for a couple of years, and then works with me to get them sold. So you yeah, very common for, for doctors or, or attorneys or other individuals who want to diversify um, to get into this space. Um, what I do find though, is that oftentimes they're able to replace their W-2 and, and, and exclusively become an, a net lease investor. It's not necessary. It's not always the case, but in, in many cases it is. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, let's walk through, you know, a lot of people don't even realize you can, you can just buy a Wendy's or a, you know, a Walgreens or whatever. They just think some big corporation owns these buildings, but it sounds like regular people own these things. So walk us through kind of a, what a typical deal might look like, or a typical situation where, you know, you have a client and they just say, Hey, Dan, I, I, I want to buy a Wendy's you have for sale. What, what do we do? What are the next steps? Yeah, so so typically, you know, I work a lot on the on the sell side. I'm I, I'm I hustle for the listings. I think that's just a better business model. I sure. do represent buyers all the time as well. But you know, typically, the way that it works is, you know, I'll have a client that that has a Wendy's that is, you know, uh, he wants to know what it's worth. I put together a value proposal for him or for her, and you know, those typically there are some corporate Wendy's deals, but the vast majority of them are franchisee owned. Now, uh, what that means is that the franchisee that an individual corporation other than Wendy's operates the actual building, right? They operate the business, I should say. So now the thing that can vary, Seth, is that there are some franchisees that have one unit or five units or 10 units, right? And some that have hundreds of units. So that's very important, right? Because if we have a franchisee that only has one or two units, the guarantee is a weak guarantee because if they go out of business at that one location or those two locations, you have nothing to go after. Whereas if they're a publicly traded company like Meritage, for example, they've got 344 locations. And even if they're going to stop uh, conducting business at that site, they're still going to pay you rent because they're going to be on the hook with the whole corporation. So typically a buyer is going to be interested in, in the asset based on the cash flow, based on the cap rate, and a lot of other fig factors. Like I said, rental escalations. In some cases, they could be 1% annually. In some cases, they could be 7.5% every five years, 10% every five years, 2% a year. They vary greatly. Um, demographics are important. Visibility uh, is important. Lease term is very important, right? Because a lease that has a longer term on it is going to be a more solid and secure investment, less risk, lower cap, uh, lower cap rate, whereas something that's shorter term has a little bit higher inherent risk and a higher cap rate, right? 
So, you know, those are factors that a buyer is going to consider when they're looking to invest in, in a net lease property. Another thing is that's important, being that this is a model that can work from anywhere in the country, is going to be whether or not it's in a tax-free state, right? Um, some In some cases, states, there are, uh, you know, no state income taxes. So those type, types of properties traded at a premium, many investors are interested only in those types of assets. Gotcha. What, what else do you look for as far as kind of location and demographics? I mean, do you look for the same things as, as multifamily or are you looking at, you know, being near major throughways or, or what are some of the things you're, you're looking for in that aspect? Yeah. So it, it depends on the type of asset, you know, something like a medical office building, it's not as important, but something like quick service restaurant or pharmacy, we're going to want to know population density, all of our offering memorandums have certain basic things in them, like population density, average household income. We want to know traffic counts. That's very important. What kind of visibility does it have? How is the ingress? How is the egress? Is there a city setback that has tons of trees on it that prevent you from seeing the pylon sign? Or is it right there on a signalized hard corner? You know, you couldn't miss it. Um, you know, those are all very important factors. Um, and then of course, there's not just the, the, the fundamental real estate factors, there's the least, uh, you know, technicalities as well. Like I said, how big is the guarantee? How much time is left on the lease? Are there options periods? What are the rental bumps like? And, and there are a lot of other clauses that are very important to, to understand. That's why it's important to work with a, you know, a skilled, um, you know, seasoned broker. In some cases, there are, I, I'm dealing with, with two Wendy's that look exactly the same on the surface. One of them has a rental abatement clause that says, and again, this lease was written 10 or 15 years ago, but it says that in the event that there is a state or government shutdown that prohibits the tenant from operating business in their dining room, they get to pay 40% decreased rent, right? I've got another Wendy's that looks exactly the same on the surface, but it says in no cases will there ever be any rent abatement. So those types of clauses can be very important. There are other things like co-tenancy clauses that state that if a property is in a shopping center and the anchor tenant, let's say it's a, it's a PetSmart and let's say there's a Lowe's or a Home Depot there, says that if the anchor tenant vacates, immediately the, the tenant in question can pay 50% of their rent. That's called a co-tenancy clause. So there's a lot of nuances in addition to the actual underlying fundamentals of the real estate. There's a lot of nuances in the actual lease language that are important to underwrite and take into consideration. Yeah, that's a lot, lot to handle right there, man. There, there's a lot more to retail leases than let's say a simple multifamily lease with a, with a family as a tenant. I mean, it's, there's a lot more that can go into it a lot more intricacies. I'm very familiar with it because I'm a real estate attorney. So I've, I've negotiated those leases, but to some people, I'll bet it's just a complete foreign language and you've got to, you've got to kind of educate them from the ground up with that stuff. Yeah, no question about it. And you, you'd be surprised. There are a lot of investors who own property and, and are not familiar with their lease and not familiar with those nuances. And, and when I speak with them about, you know, an evaluation on their property, they, they are, you know, it's an education for them as well. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say to, to someone who, you know, they hear all this stuff about, you know, Amazon taking over and, and, you know, the retail's in trouble, you know, they have a little bit of trepidation uh, with that respect. I mean, why are you bullish on, you know, triple net retail as compared to other assets? Yeah. Great question. I get this often. Um, so listen, as long as, as long as, uh, you know, a guy like you and a guy like, like myself have a dollar in our pocket, retail is going to be alive and well, right? We're, <laughs> we are a consumeristic culture. We spend a lot of money. We have a lot of disposable income. And, um, you know, people like to shop, you know, if you ask the average individual on the street, what percentage of retail is based on e-commerce, they'd probably say 70 or 80%. And that is a gross overestimation. Um, you know, typically even in, you know, in, in 2019, early 2020, we were at about 12 or 13%. The pandemic pushed e-commerce, you know, five or 10 years ahead, but we're still around 19, 20, 21%. So, you know, there, there is a demand for retail for brick and mortar. And what's very important is that a lot of these retailers that are having success, Seth, they're, they're moving towards an omni-channel fulfillment, which means that they're, uh, fulfilling orders in, in, in a way that's best for the customer. So they might have an e-commerce model. They might have a brick and mortar retail. They might have a buy online pickup in store. They might, they understand that people are coming into the store to shop and then purchasing online or shopping online and purchasing in store. They're, they're blending some experiential retail components, making it necessary for the consumer to step in the store, making it easy for them to return things from the store to get them in that, into that retail setting. So, you know, retail is changing. Uh, it's evolving, but it, it's by no means dead. I mean, and, 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 and if you look at things like cap rates on, on discount retailers, on dollar stores, those have only compressed. I mean, Dollar General, I think, opened about 600 new locations last year. They're opening 1,000 new locations this year. 
uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really, there's a lot of misinformation out there and, you know, it's important to, to really dig in deep and see that, you know, U.S. retail is strong, U.S. retail is evolving and U.S. retail is, is, is a great place to, to invest capital. Yeah, that, that 12 to 13% stat is pretty wild. I, I didn't realize it was that, uh, it was that low. Um, yeah. So you know, you noted that, you know, the successful companies are kind of using this hybrid approach where they're online, you know, they've got an online presence, they've got their brick and mortar presence. Um, any other current trends you see in the marketplace with, with respect to retail or, you know, anything else, any, any other asset types? Yeah, I mean, and I think we'll talk about this maybe a little bit later as well. I think that that what's going on is that retailers are evolving and and they're they're really working in in tandem with with the industrial product because uh, you know I think that the the model of the last decade of you know the Amazon Prime model of of having uh, you know items in fulfillment centers that can get to you in two days or more is really at this point it's an outdated model. I mean, we're moving to the the place where you're going to get them in, in two hours instead of two days. So really, the supply chain is becoming more robust. The supply chain is, is expanding and we're moving products closer and closer to consumers. So I, I expect to see, um, you know, a lot of these vacant larger boxes, because keep in mind, even pre-pandemic, you know, there was a lot of retail vacant. There was a lot of retail bankruptcy. There were a lot of companies going out of business. But really what was going on is we were seeing what we call the retail right sizing, which means that, you know, those big boxes of 20, 30, 40,000 square feet plus, we're seeing a lot of closures of those. But we were actually seeing more increases in smaller boxes or junior boxes, as we call them. So, you know, I predict that what we're going to see is that some of these well-located retail centers that are, are experiencing vacancy, especially vacancy due to the pandemic, are going to see, uh, you know, an increased occupancy from uses like those fulfillment centers, right? Bring that product closer to the consumer so they can get it faster, you know, in a more efficient manner. So that's definitely a trend that we're seeing. And I expect that to continue in the retail yeah. world. Yeah. Um, some of those big box stores that have, you know, tens of thousands of square feet. I mean, what are some of the changes in uses you're seeing people do? Um, so, you know, one of them is to be that last mile fulfillment center or that cold storage facility. Um, those are really, really big asset classes, very popular today. Um, and, and, and that's not a trend that started really during, you know, COVID. Um, I think the real inflection point for, for that industry was in June or July of 2019, when Blackstone made the largest uh, acquisition of an industrial only portfolio, $19.6 billion. And the majority of that portfolio consisted of last mile fulfillment centers and cold storage. Cold storage or refrigerated storage is exactly what it sounds like. It's those you know facilities that have a tremendous amount of tenant improvements invested in them to retrofit them and make them uh, capable of storing goods at refrigerated temperatures. Typically, tenants stay in those properties forever because they don't want to relocate. Um, they're you know mission critical locations, and they cost a lot of money to to retrofit. And then those last mile fulfillment centers are by definition irreplaceable real estate, right? You can't go five miles outside of the city and still be a last mile fulfillment center. So you know I think that those trends are are, are very strong and they're continuing, and um, that's an asset class that is just you know absolutely on fire. Yeah. Yeah, well, let's dive in a little bit to that idea that you've touched on here a few different times. And we've talked about it before, and you call it the Industrial Revolution 2.0. What, what, what exactly is that? So that's, you know, I would say a little bit contrary to what I said before, that's the movement of products off of retail shelves and into industrial warehouses. That's mm -hmm. the, the idea of, of being able to get your goods faster. That's the idea of that infrastructure and the supply chain moving, those tentacles expanding and getting closer to the consumer. And you know, that's what's really fueling this industrial boom. Because keep in mind, even if the product is fulfilled in store, right? It's not an e-commerce transaction. It still needs to get to that location, right? So we see a huge demand in, in, in the industrial space. In fact, there's two, two statistics that I think really put this in perspective. Um, and I'm very curious to see how the, this, this first statistic will be extrapolated into 2021. But something you and I have spoken about before is if you look at the number of square feet of industrial leases signed, right? That's a good indicator of what's going on in the market. So from 2019 to 2020, there was a 27% increase in the number of square feet of new industrial warehouses uh, in terms of leases signed. That's an incredible, incredible growth metric. 27% is, it's, it's, it's literally mind boggling. So, you know, couple that with, with, you know, the fact that CBRE just came out with some excellent research about major markets across the country in terms of rental appreciation. And there's a predicted 25% or more appreciation in rental rates over the next five years in 31 markets across the country. 
So if you keep in mind that our business is very simple, right? It, pricing is based on two factors. It's based on net operating income and cap rate. Well, income is going to go through the roof because you have markets that are seeing 25, 30, 35, 40% appreciation in the next five years. Demand is through the roof. So cap rates are going down. So obviously this is a hot asset classes class because cap rates are going down, rental rates are going up. Therefore price goes way up. So, you know, I mean, that's just, those are staggering numbers. And I, you know, we expect them to continue. And like I said, I'm very curious to see what 2021 brings once the year is over. Awesome. Awesome, man. Um, any other predictions as far as other asset classes, um, you know, one over the other? Yeah. I mean, I guess it's, it's funny because we've been saying for years that, you know, we don't know how much runway is left, right? Cap yeah. rates are at all time lows. And I feel like that's getting old because we've been saying it for years and granted, you know, last year brought with it some unexpected changes that I think just really fueled, you know, cap rates that maybe, maybe we wouldn't have seen had, had we not gone through this pandemic. And, you know, the fact that interest rates are, are incredibly low and have been kept low and will probably stay low also will, will continue to fuel prices and, and fuel cap rates on a downward trajectory. But at the same time, I think that this is, this is probably the, the, the highest value aside from industrial products. But if you look at the net lease world, if you own net lease property, you need to be in touch with your broker because, at this point in time, you know, we really don't know how much runway is left. And, um, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that we're seeing properties trade at, at all time historic lows. I mean, just set a record two weeks ago for the, the highest price per square foot for a quick service restaurant, uh, you know, ever in the city of Detroit. And we're seeing, you know, just all across the country cap rate compression. So I think that really now is a time to consider potentially selling your property or at least understanding what it's worth because, you know, these prices, yeah, is, it, is there going to be a little bit more downward movement? Maybe, but one thing's for sure is that, 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 that we are either at or near the absolute bottom. Yeah. Yeah. Or it's not, certainly, however you want to look at it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely a great time to sell. Um, before we jump into the freedom four, man, one last gold nugget for our listeners. Yeah. I mean, I would just say that, that um, it's, it's very important to educate yourself and to understand your asset class. Um, I think that there's a unique opportunity right now, multifamily cap rates, not that there's anything wrong with multifamily, but multifamily cap rates are also at an all-time low. And you look at major markets across the country, the cap rates are in line or even lower than the, the gold standard of net lease. So I would say that, you know, if you're, if you're someone that's considering making the jump into net lease is definitely educate yourself, definitely partner up with a good broker who will help you to underwrite those, uh, those leases and those properties. So you don't miss things like those co-tenancy clauses or like those rental abatement clauses. And, um, you know, now's a great time. If, if you have a portfolio, it's a great time to increase it. And if you're just getting in, it's a great time to start. All right, man, let's jump into the Freedom Four. It's time for the Freedom Four. What's the best thing you do to keep your mind and body healthy? Oh, good question. Um, I would say, uh, you know, to keep the mind healthy is reading, which I haven't been doing as much reading as I usually do, but definitely reading is, is very, very important. And, um, you know, I think that for me, you know, I have, I also have a show and I get to interview really great, brilliant minds. So, so I would say interacting with other, uh, you know, thought leaders and experts in the industry allows me to, um, you know, just learn a lot, keep my skills sharp and really, you know, expand my, my knowledge base. And then, um, in terms of keeping my body healthy, I mean, honestly, that, that is sometimes quite a struggle, but I, I like to, to go for walks outside, clear my head get my body moving, be outside in nature and just like, you know, kind of expand things so that I can, can think a little bit clearer. Yeah. Yeah. Got to have that little break in there, man. What's one life hack technology or otherwise that you use to be your most productive self? Uh, definitely OneDrive actually. It sounds silly, but like, you know, <laughs> I love Microsoft OneDrive. I mean, on my phone, I have everything, every single document that's on my computer is on my phone. I can be anywhere in the world and pull up you know, any spreadsheet or offering memorandum. And it gives me the freedom and flexibility to really work from anywhere, even if I don't have a computer. So, I mean, it sounds silly, but that or the organizational um, efficiencies that I've been able to create through, through, you know, cloud-based storage of all of my documents has really helped me to be more efficient. Yeah. I don't know what we ever did before cloud storage where we can just access everything. Right. <laughs> That's insane, man. What's one actual step our listeners can do right now to start creating more freedom? I would say just jump in, you know, get involved, question what you're doing. You know, uh, you, you had that moment. I've had that moment. A W2 job is great. Nothing wrong with it. Um, it's, it's secure, right? It's stable, but it's definitely limited. Um, if somebody wants to, to increase that, um, you know, their ability to, to, um, you know, 
create wealth. I think that they should consider real estate investing and, you know, being an entrepreneur and, you know, putting in that time and energy and, and, and also talking to other people who have done it, right? If you have a, a parent who, you know, worked for 50 years on a W-2 and you want to go to them and tell them that you want to start your own business, you're probably going to get pushback. But if it's something that you're looking to do, there's tons of people out there. I remember when I did it, I talked to other people who had made the plunge and it's probably one of the best things I've ever done to be able to have that freedom, that flexibility, and to, in a sense, be able to, you know, write my own ticket. So I would say that, uh, you know, one of the things to do is to just get started and to, to be massively active and to network with other people who are going to support you in your mission. Yeah, that's a big key, man. I mean, networking and just getting around other people that are doing that same thing. And they're not just, you know, your coworkers at your job, because you're not going to learn anything new that you don't already know from those folks. You need to get around people that are, are kind of, you know, they're doing real estate, they're investing in businesses, they're doing different things. And then your, your mind starts to expand a little bit. Exactly. How has passive income made your life better? Oh, it's a good question. So, uh, you know, believe it or not, I, I, I got out of, of uh, my rental portfolio in the end of 2019. Um, and I think it was great timing. Um, you know, I just, I felt like um, at a certain point, I'd be able to buy those properties back for pennies on the dollar. And, um, you know, for me, I, I'm a young guy, I've got a lot of energy. So I don't mind that, you know, all of my income pretty much comes from, um, you know, commercial real estate brokerage and, and, and closing deals. I will tell you though, that, you know, investing in the equities markets and, you know, my, my IRA and, and brokerage accounts has helped me because I can literally focus on my, uh, you know, my main hustle. And then I have a rule, 15% minimum of every deal gross. So before any of my expenses, 15% immediately gets invested. So that that's money that I don't even, I don't even think about. And the great thing is I'm able to just, you know, pull up my, my, my accounts and look at them, continue focusing on what I'm doing and have that building up in the background. And, you know, it just enables me to have that freedom. And if one day I don't want to work or I want to travel or, or whatever, I, I don't have that stress of, 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 of thinking, oh, what am I going to do if I don't have a paycheck that week? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it comes down to discipline. A lot of people have a hard time, you know, socking that money away. Uh, they just spend it all as soon as they get it. But it sounds like you've got a pretty good, pretty good plan in place. Yeah. And you know, one of the things my, my dad always told me was pay yourself first. And it's yeah. really important because at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter how much money you make. The real, the real important thing is the Delta between what you make and, and what you, you spend and, you know, paying yourself first, it's, it's, it's out of sight. It's out of mind. It's out of my possession. And that that's just, that's what's worked for me. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Dan, it's been great having you on today. We're going to listeners find out more about you. Yeah. So number one, I'm very active on LinkedIn. So you can find me on LinkedIn. First name is Dan, last name Lukowitz, L-E-W-K-O-W-I-C-Z. Um, also, if you, know, if you own commercial property, you want to know what it's worth. Um, if you want to sell your property or if you just want to talk shop in, in, in real estate, you know, get in touch with me. Uh, probably best way is to reach me on my cell phone, which is 248 nine four three two eight three eight again two four eight nine four three two eight three eight if there's anything i can do i'm always happy to add value awesome awesome dan's got an awesome podcast as well dan on top uh tons of value uh man puts out all kinds of content you guys got to listen to that dan again great to have you on today brother yeah thanks so much i really appreciate it thanks man my god dan bring in the heat the cre pro all right major key don't think these types of assets are out of reach. Attorneys, doctors, investors, just like you and me, own these things. It's time to expand your mind past that HGTV fix and flip. You have the power to buy an apartment complex. You have the power to buy a CBS. If you have working capital, you're closer to an early retirement than you think. You can invest passively, you can invest actively, a combination of both, and free yourself from the rat race. All right, y'all. If you enjoyed the show, please share a link with your friends and family. Spread the good word. I'd also really appreciate a quick five-star rating review. It only takes a few seconds and it helps get this podcast out there and in front of more people just like you. Have a great rest of your day. Signing off. Enjoy the journey. Thank you for listening to the Passive Income Attorney Podcast with Seth Bradley. Do you want more ideas on how to generate multiple streams of passive income? Then jump over to PassiveIncomeAttorney.com for show notes and resources. Then apply for the private Facebook community by searching for the Passive Income Attorney on Facebook. And we'll see you on the next episode.